back with you on the Two Deep NFL Podcast. Jeff Chidea from the NFL Network. Eric Eager from Sumer Sports. My name is Seren Petro. Sports Radio 810 WHP. we got a lot to cover. Rule changes to the kickoff, the hip drop tackle. Uh, the NFL moving the trade deadline back. A lot changing when it comes to the uh, NFL. Uh, two games are going to be played on Christmas. Good idea, bad idea. Uh, Matt Eberflus said uh, Caleb Williams' teammates love him. They respect him. Uh, that's great. Uh, who won the trade for LeJarrius Sneed? Mike Tomlin uh, has already named uh, Russell Wilson the starter. Is this a mistake? J.J. McCarthy moving up the draft board. Uh, are critics making too much of the Cowboys not splashing around some cash? We're talking about it right now on the Two Deep NFL Podcast. You're listening to the Two Deep Podcast, the most complete analysis of the National Football League, breaking down the NFL like no one else can. Too Deep is hosted by Jeff Chadia, Eric Eager, and Seren Petro. Jeff Chadia is a senior columnist and on-air personality for the NFL Network and NFL.com. Eric Eager is the vice president of research and development for Sumer Sports. Seren Petro was the afternoon drive host of the program on Sports Radio 810 WHB in Kansas City. Too Deep is proudly brought to you by Gan Asphalt and Concrete, Kansas City's nationally recognized full-service paving and pavement maintenance contractor, making parking lot problems disappear since 1994. Free consultations, no commissions, in-house crews, and every project comes with a written warranty. Find them online at ganasphalt.com or call 816-484-3338. Gan Asphalt and Concrete, one contractor, all things parking lot. Now, here are the hosts of the Two Deep Football Podcast, Jeff Chidea, Eric Eager, and Soren Petro. Thank you very much, Curtis. Uh, we are live here on a Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Central. That's when we're normally scheduled to uh, stream live and catch us via the podcast. Remember, you can be a part of the conversation. Uh, be a part in the uh, chat room. Uh, join us uh, Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. Central. Uh, a lot of rule changes, guys. Uh, let's dive right in there. Uh, thoughts on uh, what they've done now when it comes to the uh, kickoff rule, the hip drop tackle, uh, NFL trade deadline. Let's start with the hip drop. Uh, what do you think about that being outlawed, Jeff? Is this something that referees are going to be able to accurately uh, penalize during the uh, football season? It will be an adjustment. It's going to take some time. They will get this wrong at times. You almost wish that they would do what they did in the in college football when it came to targeting. You could make the call and then go look at it and see if you actually got it right. Because I think that is a it is a it's a tackle that one needs to be removed from the game. I know there's been a lot of defensive players out there bitching and moaning about it. I know that it's very hard to get big tight ends on the ground and big running backs on the ground when they got a full head of steam and you're behind them. But I. I've just seen too many guys get hurt from it. And it's like, it's like the horse collar tackle. It's one of those tackles where you know that it's the chances of thing bad happening. If somebody's doing it are really high. So I don't mind it getting out of the game, but I do agree with you that it's, it's because of the, how narrow the window is to get this call, right. It will, it will get miscalled a lot this coming season. Okay. You on board, Eric? I am. I made a joke. Like, I had a lot of fantasy football exposure this year to Tony Pollard and anybody who's against this rule should have to watch all of Tony Pollard's carries this year. Uh, My guy, my guy went from an explosive up and coming running back to one of the huffest, like slowest, least inspiring players I've ever seen. And I and Kenyon Drake, he he did he tweeted this out or went on Instagram and said the same thing. Like, the, you know, he was robbed of a few years of his career because of one of those tackles. Like, I agree with Jack. Like, I, I I understand that the game is being made harder for defensive players. I get that, and I understand that. And I I what I don't like is how much these guys are getting fined. I I think that that's one where. You know, the NFL really needs to think about how the appearances look, where you have owners who are all predominantly white and rich, and you have players who are all, who are, you know, majority, uh, minority, you know, uh, players, and you're taking money out of their pockets uh, in, in certain ways. But with respect to this rule, 
I think you have to do something because Mark Andrews is going down. You have, uh, you know, uh, Tony Pollard, as I said, like you have significant players and you're worried about the league four years ago, 49 points a game. Now it's 43 points a game. You have to get these offensive players healthy. So I think that at worst, it's going to be like the pass interference thing a few years ago where uh, the the officials are just like, ah, we're not going to call. We're not going to overturn any pass interference, just like we're not going to call any hip drop tackles. Um, I think at best, they do a really good job of explaining themselves. That's a lot for the NFL, frankly. Um, and I think that um, – but I, I'm in favor of it, actually. Uh, I'm in favor of it. I actually, listen, and I don't think the refs are very good, and I've been beating this drum for a long, long time, and I welcome everybody to the party um, over the last couple of years. But I actually think the the horse collar, they do a pretty good job of. Yeah. Right? Like they Sometimes suck. it's bad, but they're, they're, they're bad at every call. Yeah. Their, their pass interference is atrocious. Um, you know, they, they have no idea when somebody's, you know, false starting whatsoever. Um, like they're, they're completely ambiguous about where people line up, but they're pretty good at the horse collar. I think this one kind of shows itself pretty easily. Right. And I do get it. My, my fear is that where I feel for defensive players, look, if you're good, you, you're graded against your peers who all have to play by the same rules, unless the league becomes so offensive that it's like no defensive players paid, right? It's just all about the offense because nobody can bring anybody down. I, I do worry about that, and I do miss the physicality. But, like, guys, you know, they they got away from the horse collar. They came up with this, right? I don't remember this being a thing when <laughs> yeah. Walter Payton and Earl Campbell and O.J. Simpson and Jim Brown were going, there's no hip drop tackle. Like, they couldn't horse collar, so yeah. they came up with this. They'll yeah. come up with something new. I mean, or, you know, the game will just be more offensive, which – I think it needs a little bit of that, right? I think it could use a little jolt to the offense. I actually think they need to find a way, first of all, getting rid of all the delays on reviewing everything would be my first choice, and then stopping the clock a little bit more because I hate a four-possession half. Yeah. What the hell is that? Well, well they've, done, they've done a real – they've gotten super liberal with a guy gets knocked out of bounds and they don't even stop the clock and rewind. Yeah. They just – and, like, to your point, Petro, I mean, you look at every Chiefs playoff game – has been is like a four possession half game. Like we want to see Mahomes. Like, yeah, I, I, that's the one thing is these games have all gotten shorter. Yeah, and Tommy brought up the fact the NFL PA was was against this. They're against the fines. <laughs> like they're not yeah, as concerned about the, the flags being thrown as players getting fined because really one of the things that happened a lot to get a ton of discussion was running backs and offensive players were getting killed for dropping their heads, you know, like leading with the uh, the crown of their helmets. They were getting hit like 40, 50 grand a pop for that. And so – Which is part a of lot of money. Issue, yeah, yeah. And part of this issue with the hip drop tackle, tackling has been bad in the NFL for the last 20 years. They don't practice it. They, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of it's just about how athletic you are. And so this – the hip drop tackle is, is really a result of just bad technique being allowed to happen. If they coach it differently – they wouldn't do it. Who benefits most from the uh, kickoff rule change, Eric? Uh, I think it's, you know, when we were growing up, uh, we were growing up, when I was growing up, it was Mel Gray, it was Glenn Milburn. What do you say, it Jeff was, and I were already growing? We saw those guys too, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like, you guys yeah. remember, you, you know, like, in our Ronnie life. Harmon was a first-round pick in the NFL. Uh, Steven Sewell was a first-round pick in the NFL. Um, I think it helps running backs, Eric right? Metcalf. Which we've needed forever. Like Glenn Milburn was a guy that everybody loved talking about. Eric Metcalf was a guy everybody loved talking about. Uh, obviously, you know, we had Ted Ginn was taken as a top 10 pick in response to Devin Hester being an amazing rookie for the Bears in 2006. I think it benefits some of those kind of tweener, you know, I think we're we're going to get more Jameer Gibbs types player, type players, Mel, you know, and you know, we just saw Cordell Patterson literally get a contract today from Pittsburgh years after his prime. I think you're going to get a little bit of that. I think you're going to get more linebackers, um, it, more depth linebackers, more depth safeties, uh, which I don't think is great for the game. I think you need to develop – like guys like Felix Onozuki Uzama are not going to be active as much. And I know there's people in the league who are kind of – of my persuasion who are like, I'd rather there be fewer special teams so I can get – 
my younger players at premium positions like defensive end on the field more, even those guys that don't play special teams. But I think it's going to be guys like that that are going to benefit. And that's, you know, that could be cool. And we we used to idolize those guys in the NFL. We used to idolize David Palmer and like guys like that who used to were like the gadgety guys. And I think that that puts them back into the fold a little bit. Because punt. the other part of this is punters are so good in the NFL now. You do not get punt returns the way they used to because these guys can hang the ball for five seconds now. And so you're just going to get more returns because now guys can return kickoffs and the few punts they get to return. You know, I think Eric raises an interesting point about who's going to be on return teams now because it almost feels like this is almost like the, the kickoff that goes, you know, the team attempts a long kickoff, it goes in the end zone, they return it, bring it back out, right? And so if you got a whole bunch of big guys on the field, how much does that hurt your ability to tackle guys in, in space? You know what I mean? So, like, does that affect roster construction now? I mean, you're asking more guys who are starters. Like, I don't see Jameer Gibbs out there returning kicks, but are you asking more starters to be out there like Seattle did back in the day with Richard Sherman and, you know, Bobby Wagner, these guys running down on covering kicks. I mean, it's it does raise interesting questions. I'm not as sold on it how how exciting of a play it's going to end up being ultimately, but I do like the attempt at trying to make it bring it back into the game. Yeah, I do too. Are we? Let's have a show of hands. Uh, it's only in for one year, so they'll review it after this year. Is it still in effect in 25? Who thinks that this will work and they'll bring it back in 25? I don't think they'll bring it back. Yeah. But I don't think that they'll – I mean, if – I think it's still going great, back, to be honest with you. Was, so when they – my friend Sam Schwartzstein put it in the XFL in 2020 pre-pandemic, there were zero injuries on the play in the first five weeks of that before the pandemic. Uh, that's the biggest reason why they don't have the kick off now the way it is because it's injuries. And – the reason that they're doing the whole like everybody shipped up is because they don't want the collisions. Well, you're not going to get collisions because it's basically a scrimmage play. Um, and to Jeff's point, it might mean that your kickoff returners, it's always been historically that your kickoff returners are the, the speedier guys and your punt returners are the shiftier guys. And maybe it means that your kickoff returners now are more the shiftier guys too, because you don't have that run up that you used to have before. Um, it might be. It, 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 I think it's cool. I think it. I think it'll. To, to Jeff's point, it'll raise different questions about what kind of player is going to benefit from that because I, I'm not sure it's clear yet. Yeah, I agree. I, I do like the idea of everybody's got to dive in and figure out something new, right? These coaches are paid millions of dollars. Get to work, figure it out, right? Like mm-hmm. that. That to me it is going to be fun watching them. You know, try to figure this out and try to make it happen. Um, how, how about moving the trade deadline back? after week nine, Jeff, you on board? Yeah, I mean, look, I think you've asked any GM out there, they would tell you the later, the better. (laughs) Because when you go back 20 years, it was even earlier than that. It just felt like you didn't get trades happening at all because you barely knew what what your needs were. You didn't know what the market was out there for. And GMs were a lot more conservative about making a move where they didn't have enough information. I think you get to week nine – after midseason, teams have a clear idea what they want to do, who fits. I think you'll see more movement. It's been very exciting for the last, whatever, it's been seven, eight years to have the trade deadline mean something now because more and more teams are starting to, to be aggressive about it. And so, yeah, I think the later you move it back, the more aggressive you're going to see teams become. Yeah, I, I, listen, I, I, I'm, I like the comment about I'm glad it's still kicking, right? Like, I, I, I like the idea that we've still got a kickoff in the equation. I don't know why nostalgia, you know, could you just line it up at the 20 or 25 or 30 or whatever yard line and go? You could, but I do like that there's kind of this different aspect of the game. So uh, I'm I'm willing to try just about anything to, to keep it going, uh, you know. Uh, we do get probably to Tommy Moe's point, which for the first time in like God knows how long you made a great point here, but Kadarius Tony might be back. We, we get gifted Kadarius Tony uh, in Kansas City here for another year. Yeah, I was, I was joking, Tommy Mo. I'm just I'm just messing with you. But but we get Kadarius Tony possibly back for one more year. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I morphed it back into the kickoff. Table. I was going to say, where are we going with well, this conversation? I was, reading, I was reading comments, <laughs> and I was just like, wait a minute, was that what I asked? What are we talking about? Yeah. 
I was reading. <laughs> that's totally my fault. Because yeah. I was yeah. reading different comments and things yeah. that were coming in, and I was like, wait a minute, we were talking about the, the trade deadline. Yeah. I, I do think the deadline. It's nice to know that Seren gets lost. That's every right. once in a while, it's, it's not it's just me. The two yeah. multiverse going on yeah, right now. There are there are a lot. Of, I'll take a picture sometime and put it up there. There are a lot of things on the screen right now. Um, the but but I, I I do like moving it back, right? Like moving the trade deadline back because I think it, it you know if you're in it, you got more time to make a move, right? And what I do, what I hope, because I think NFL free agency is great. I think the only thing baseball does right now is they got a lot of activity at the trade deadline. The NBA has some. The NBA has a great free agency period. But I think it just brings people into it. I think if you got a little more time, maybe GMs, who I think are so gun-shy of doing something, I'm hoping this will get more trades, which to me keeps people more involved. If your team's out of it and you can sell later, you know, you still got, okay, two weeks that guy lost somebody. They need someone. We can still sell. I think that's I think that's good for the game. I think it keeps people interested. Yeah, here's the thing. like. The Lions, before they restored the roar, they traded TJ Hawkinson to the Vikings when they were, what, one and six? Yep. It would have been nice if they were three and six and they could have made a different decision. Now, it, it you know, they got Laporta and everything out of it, so it ended up working out. The Packers traded Rasul Douglas to the Bills. Now, interestingly, the Packers traded Rasul Douglas to the Bills for more than what the Chiefs got for the Jerry Sneed. It shows how much you're trading contracts in the NFL. But the you know Packers fans were kind of going crazy because – it's like, well, why did we trade? It's like, because no one knew that you were good, right? Two more weeks lets you know whether or not you're good. You know, like that helps. That makes, you know, that makes people, um, that makes people, uh, you know, a, a little bit more efficient. And for players' sake, right? Like I know players don't like moving too much, but for players who want to win championships, it probably puts them in a better position, right? Because if you're, if you're, in, you know, but yeah, you know, everybody in the AFC West knows they ain't winning anything other than Kansas City. But by week nine, you really know you're not winning anything, as opposed to week seven. So, so get some of those players out of the Chargers, Raiders, and Broncos, and into some real teams. Uh, Gain Asphalt and Concrete nationally recognized full service paving and pavement maintenance contractor, making parking lot problems disappear since 1994. You can find them online at Gain asphalt.com proud sponsor of the two deep nfl podcast two games on christmas day okay they played on christmas this year it's freaking wednesday jeff it's wednesday why why are we yeah. doing this like the, there are some people like my buddy curtis who does the open he's adamant no game should ever be played on christmas people should be able to be home with their families i mean I, that's noble that's great people also like to do things together with their family on christmas like i used to love to go to the movies on Christmas. Well, somebody's got to pop the popcorn, right? I used to be that guy, by the way, who worked yeah. the movie theater and tore your tickets and popped your popcorn. Uh, I work Christmas. I, by the way, I got paid double. Uh, so I don't know that that's happening in the NFL, but at the Wednesday thing, come on. That, that to me is the part that's being buried. They're going to play two games on Wednesday. Yeah. And none of you guys have, none of you have a conspiracy theory, uncle or three. This save every normal nephew is rejoicing at like anything, any come on, guys. Like anything that anything on that TV screen, up. anything that on, on that TV screen that isn't the news or like football brings us together, boys. Like that. No, <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I'm not like I get it, and I, I understand the morals of it. And I get. I understand what you guys are all saying, and I'm just kind of joking a little bit here. But I got to tell you, uh, nothing brings a. Nothing brings me closer to my in-laws who I have nothing in common with, more like football. So I'm all for it. Well, I just love that we just had this huge dialogue around, uh, you know, the, the safety of the hip drop tackle and the safety of the kickoff. And now we're talking about Wednesday football games. You know, right. It exactly. just seems like the, 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 the hypocrisy. Tina, I'm joking, by the way. Yeah, I'm well, joking. It, it's going to be interesting because – the teams that play are going to play on Saturday before, so it becomes like a Thursday night game. But that means you're basically going to get a little round robin. Yeah. Right? You're, you're so, just getting screwed a few times. You're going to get short rest twice in a row. Yes. That's stupid. Like, we just – the NFL – the NFL is the emperor with no clothes. Every single thing they do, they're trans – but, like, we all – all three of us are going to be watching those games, right? And we're all going to – 
you know, we're all going to be apologizing to our spouses and our in-laws and whatever about about this. We're all like, well, they're going to have playoff yeah. implications properly, right? Yeah, most of the games this past year had playoff implications. Yeah, like that's so. And and I'm not even joking about this. Like these are the rare things I have in common with some of my family members. So yeah, I'm like I'm pro game like. I don't really know any W or any NBA players. So like when the, when it's just the NBA games on a Christmas, now our guy, Adam Silver has got to be pretty pissed though. Right. Yeah. That, that, that's, that, that train was they took a his long day. time ago. Yeah. They took yeah. his day. That was yeah. his day. Uh, I, I do like this. Great. Now we all got to figure out how to sign up for Peacock again. <laughs> uh, I thought that was great. And I also like this one. Game on Christmas, Matt says. Now I get to listen to my dad talk utter nonsense about football. It that, depends on how your football viewing is. You know what it means for me? If my team's on there, I got to have a fight with my wife again. Because I always watch the game with friends. And it's like, I mean, really? On Christmas Day? Like, your friend? Like, my I little didn't... nephew telling me the entire day because the Chiefs are losing to the Raiders that Mahomes was Mahomes is awful and over the hill. And then they hadn't lost, they hadn't lost sense. That was fun. Yeah. Um, Matt Eberflus uh, said they had dinner with uh, Caleb Williams and his receivers after his pro day. It was great to just watch him. He said his teammates really love him. They respect him. I mean, isn't that like if you have to say that, isn't that kind of the warning sign, Jeff? Well, there's definitely like uh, Caleb Williams is definitely fighting some kind of a, I don't want to say it's a PR campaign, but he's he's definitely every week that's gone on since he stopped playing for USC. He's been, the narrative has been, he's a bigger prima donna. And I don't know if it's true or not, but it seems to have a lot of smoke around it. And the bears going into this, a lot of this has to do where they play football. They've never ever had a quarterback who maybe Rex Grossman was in that category. Who's coming in with this level of, you know, uh, I guess what's the right word, charisma around him. And so they do not want that city to not be in love with Caleb Williams the minute he shows up, knowing how much Justin Fields was a very popular guy in that locker room. He won some respect within the city with the way he handled things. That team was turning a corner when he was leaving. So you, there's a lot of people in that franchise who weren't happy about him getting traded. Or, you know, or so it's like it, it's it feels as if. This is more about trying to sell Caleb Williams as a blue collar Chicago type guy than anything else. And yeah, maybe that's maybe that's some red flags about it, but he's still gonna be there. He's still gonna be up the, the top pick in the draft. Yeah, he's gonna be the guy. It just feels to me like you're selling pretty hard, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you are trying to convince yourself almost that yeah, he's got warts, but look at this. Well, what did you think they were gonna do? Yeah. Sitting at the table with a with a team they hope drafts him there, throw food at him. I've never yeah. heard of a team taking the quarterback and the receivers out. Yeah. That's, Have I, you, Eric? No, but I mean, my issue though is what? Okay, then trade the pick, trade to two, and and take Drake May and get a haul and just end this whole thing, right? Like that's the way to go about this, and. Because to me, I, I just saw this, you know, in between shows, and I can't resist because everybody's like, well, Trevor Lawrence was talked about the same way Caleb Williams was. And what if he ends up like Trevor Lawrence? I'm like, hey, the, the Jaguars were picking first twice yeah. in a row. And now Trevor Lawrence has that dog ass franchise to two straight winning seasons. If 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 Caleb Williams does that for the Bears, you better start making the statue. They haven't won. They haven't had two straight winning seasons in Chicago since Rex was the quarterback. Like these Bears, this the idea of Justin Fields is the best quarterback that's ever played in the NFL. I don't get it. Like my issue with with the Caleb Williams stuff is okay. He has warts. Every quarterback that's ever been drafted, Peyton Manning was Peyton Manning was a, a, a weirdo to trainers. You know. Uh, Etc. Like there, I get Caleb Williams says his words. Take him or don't. But stop talking about Justin Fields. The results with Justin Fields were terrible. Yeah. Like we got to stop talking about Fields. Yeah. Um. I, I don't know who was talking about Fields till 
until you brought him up, but you know, um, so, but I, I get your point. I know I do agree. I don't, that, that one's baffled me. I never thought there was even a thought. Well, I mean, no, all yeah. the discussion about all the discussion about Caleb Williams, it's all centered around Justin Fields. It's Justin, like Justin yeah, Fields casts a big shadow over that team. Yeah. He just does. But, but don't, they, but don't they, you think, don't you think that part of this is just college players in the NIL era, the transfer portal era are going to bring more conversation about how they deal with things, their entitlement. I mean, I think that's part of this. Just the guy's been making money and been dealing with marketing people and all this stuff for the last couple of years. It's like, I think that's getting held against him. <laughs> yeah, but but all these guys have been kooks. Jim McMahon was a was the weirdest freaking guy of all time, and he nah. was a, like the Bears drafted him. And he won a Super Bowl. Like Rex Grossman was a weirdo. All of these guys, like Don McNabb, like your guy, you know, like they're all quirky. It's just that Caleb Williams cried in the stands next to his mom, and we're gonna, and, and he painted his fingernails. Like, who gives a crap? Like he's the same Johnny Manziel better than all these other guys. Yeah. I, 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 who gives a crap? I mean, the Browns who drafted Johnny Manziel. Okay. I mean, it all matters. Like, it, like, like you, like you're supposed to figure out, you know, is this guy going to be a success or not? And he is a different kind of cat. And I think it just speaks to, you know, the fact that, you know, he, there's some risk here and there, there oh, could sure. be for themselves. There always He's is. The right well, that might, but that's everybody. Well, that, with the, that could be your conversation, right? They're going to take him. We know they're going to take yeah. him. So, and I'm with you, but I, my point just is, going to take him because both coach and, and GM have to now, whether they want to or not. To your point, and they, they probably feel a little bit cornered, kind of like Bryce Young's thing got brought up. You know, I, I don't I don't think, you know, the head coach wanted to take Bryce Young last year. He ended up fired. So is that that's what I'm laying out. Are we seeing those signs again? You know, once it started going to hell in a handbasket, everyone's like, well, you know, Frank Reich didn't want him. Frank Reich didn't want it. Well, yeah, but th that was not a drum that was being beaten on opening day. Right. Yeah. So my, my whole deal stuff. is, but my whole issue is the consensus. If you don't take, if you don't take Caleb Williams first, it is a colossal blunder because the the market in the NFL draft is efficient, as it's a it's as, as efficient as any as it's going to be. So to sit here and talk about how there's bus potential in the first overall pick, it's like yeah. Of course there is. Yeah. It's a human, it's human capital. Welcome to the show. It's yeah. just, it, it's, and the, and the bears should know better than anybody that the, if you take a quarterback in the first round, he might suck. And it's just like, let grow up Peter Pan. Like this is, this is, this is, this is, this is the real world. And, and, and I, I think that they all want, they, and Jeff's right. Jeff brings it. They all wanted to keep fields. They all love fields. Every fields cast a big shadow over the team. For a guy that didn't do shit, and I don't know why, and I like, and he's not a he's not a jerk, and I get it. He and I, I understand why they like Fields. He he has some explosiveness to him and all that kind of stuff. But the results, he he's a he was gonna get two head coaches fired, and so they had to move on. Like he, I don't know, it was weird. I don't know. Jeff, it's pretty clear that Eric would be starting Russell Wilson right now. <laughs> Did Mike Tomlin make the right decision? In announcing Russell Wilson's the guy, yeah, yeah. Look, I, I, knowing Mike Tomlin, there's two things at play. One, he's trying to get his team to be more professional. That was a big deal, and I know Russ has got his own issues. You know, his, all the stuff that came with Denver that was discussed, but he works his butt off, and so he wants to have a leader walking in that locker room playing center, playing under under center, who understands how to win games, who's won games, who's got credibility. So that that's what he wants first and foremost. Second thing, I think he wants to give Justin Fields a little bit of an opportunity to get settled in, soft reset, you know, do your thing, get ready, you know, no pressure on you. And yeah, if Russell's not getting it done, you're gonna be the, you're gonna get the job. But I think to have First of all, I think to have Justin come in and say you're the starter or it's going to be a competition, somebody's got to be the first quarterback, the first ring quarterback when, the, when they start practicing. And so I, I don't have a problem with that. And I think if Russ plays the way he played, 
for Denver last year, and there are differing opinions about how good it was. I know this. It was better than Kenny Pickett. And so you've got a couple good running backs. You've got a really talented receiver. You've got a good tight end. They you got a great defense. Having Russell play quarterback for them in week one it would not be the worst thing in the world for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I assume you agree, Eric. Well, I I think both guys, I like I'm cool with them fighting for the job. I think it's good, it's okay to give Russ the job right away because he's proven more at the NFL level than than Fields ever has. I I'm excited. Um for the prospect of fields with Arthur Smith. Remember Arthur Smith, we were all there in an AFC championship game with Ryan Tannehill. Tannehill, uh, one of his big flaws was he took a lot of sacks. Justin Fields takes a lot of sacks. And uh, uh, Arthur Smith was able to engineer offense around him. One of the underrated parts, and Jeff said it, was in the second half of last year, the Pittsburgh Steelers offensive line and their running backs somehow figured out how to move the football on the ground. And so – if Arthur Smith can lean into that with Harris and 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 Warren, uh, obviously have Fryermuth and Washington at tight end is very similar to what Tennessee had with with John New Smith and and Anthony Ferkser. Um at wide receiver. Pickens kind of represents a, like a poor man's AJ Brown. Like there are the ingredients for Justin Fields to succeed there in a Ryan Tannehill busted first round pick way. Uh, I think he has to earn it. And I'm hope I hopefully I'm hoping he does. I I just I just yeah like I think it's just a different calculus in Pittsburgh. I'm ex, I'm excited for what Pittsburgh can do. I think Arthur Smith was a bad head coach. I think he's a good offensive football model, yep. and I think that I think that that I think Pittsburgh's done a good job this offseason. I I don't know if they're going to win a lot of games because that division is so tough, but they've given themselves a fighting chance. And I think I if Field starts for them. He will have earned it, and if he, if he earns it, I think he'll be pretty good. Yeah, I agree. Your job as a as a as a franchise is to upgrade the quarterback position whenever possible, and they have definitively done that. And so I, I give them credit. Which guy? I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't mind telling Russ he can fight it out, but you might not have Russ. I, I to me, it smells of this is what it took to get him to sign because everybody was going to give him the same league yeah. minimum deal. So if you wanted him, I think that's the part that's not getting discussed. If you wanted him, you were going to have to give him that. You give him that, you get him in. If three games and he sucks, you turn to Fields. Like, like, I, like uh, this. The idea I've heard some people like, I can't believe this. You know, where's the? They preach competition. They do this. Listen, they will compete, and coaches lie all the time. I mean, that's that's how it works. They say what they the team needs to hear now, yeah. right? Not try to predict the future. Can you pick it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, for sure. Who got the better end of the deal is the way it's been phrased by a lot of people uh, with Legereus Sneed going to the Titans. I think that's obvious. Legereus Sneed's a better player. Chiefs had cap issues uh, with their situation. But what makes his contract a success for the Tennessee Titans, Jeff? Like, what, what makes the trade and the contract a success for the Tennessee Titans? Well, if you get three, I don't say that the year – that Steve just had is it was exceptional. But if he is a Pro Bowl caliber cornerback for three more years, it's it's a win. I mean, they're trying to reset their culture there. They picked up Chadobia Awuzie from Cincinnati. They they signed Tony Pollard. They signed Calvin Ridley. They're, they're trying to become a more explosive team, a more um, dynamic team. And so, look, they're going to see C.J. Stroud twice a year. <laughs> they're going to see Trevor Lawrence. Twice a year, they're going to see Anthony Richardson when he gets healthy. Twice a year, like having a competent defensive back play. Jeffrey Simmons is still there up front. They're trying to figure out how to put it back together, but I think it allows them at least to have a player whose championship pedigree never hurts having that in the locker room. Uh, he didn't make All Pro or Pro Bowl, but he played at that level. I think he's coming in there. I think he has an impact. If he gives you impactful play for three years, it's a win. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, what would you call a success uh, if you're the Titans? Yeah, I mean, it's just hard to tailor it to team success. But if Lajarius Sneed is a top 15 corner in the NFL for three years, that's a success, in my opinion. They didn't give up a ton. I, I would judge it just like a free agency signing because I don't think a third round pick is really material to the to the to the discussion. So if you were signing a free agent to this deal, you would want him to be a top half of the cornerback once that's what he's that's what he's being paid like 
Uh, so yeah, and and he is to stay healthy. I mean, that's the biggest reason why the market for him wasn't particularly high was the knee, right? So health for three years, and he's got to be a top end corner in the NFL for three years. But well, and Eric saw this with the Bengals because he, he, he's a Cincinnati guy. Look at what Awuzie, Mike Hilton, what those guys meant to the Bengals when they showed up there a couple of years ago. Like they became a really good defense, and they went to the Super Bowl. Wow, Jeff, you have such a good point. The Bengals, the 2021 year where they knocked up the Chiefs, they signed, and and none of these guys are good on their own, but they signed Trey Waynes, Chidobe Awuzie, uh, Mike Hilton, Eli Apple, Trey Flowers, H- Vernon Hargreaves, Von Bell, and my friend Ricardo Allen. No, and all those guys have been starters before. And they Trey Waynes was paid the most money of all of them, and he got the least amount of snaps. They just let the best five play, and we all saw what happened. And not only that, anybody that watched the Bengals play against the Chiefs this year, we saw what happened when all those guys left. And their defense was a big play machine for the opposite opposition. Like it's all about it's all about playing the numbers game, and that's the other reason why it was probably sage for the Chiefs not to sign Snead because it again, it's you don't want to concentrate your 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 risk on all one player, and that's why it's a risky move for the Titans because once you put a twenty million dollar tag on one one corner you put a lot of pressure on them the, the chiefs had no choice but to trade him they, they their cap dictated it and they have step at the position but for the titans one thing that i think is underplayed is i do think he's the perfect candidate to move to safety now, he'll be expensive at safety but i think you know we have seen charles woodson and rod woodson probably the two best examples of corners that moved to safety and they were worth corner money at the safety position Jerry Sneed has some of those traits. He's tough. He can blitz. He's long enough to maybe go handle tight ends later in his career. So I do think there's kind of a maybe a back end if the knee holds up. And that's the big question, I think, with him. J.J. McCarthy from your alma mater, Jeff, Michigan, very impressive in his combine or his pro day, um, and I guess the combine as well. Um, Some people saying that he could creep into the top three. Are you buying that, or is this – you know, somebody try. Is this the Arizona Cardinals trying to sell the fourth pick? To somebody? <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have bought it a month ago, but I was at his pro day and I, I was impressed. I mean, a lot of people who were there were impressed. There was a lot of head coaches, a lot of general managers. You know, I saw John Lynch on the way in, the Niners general manager. He talked about the amount of talent they had overall, and the quarterback was clearly the the blue chip of the product. And the way he, the way they were in the pro day was interesting because it wasn't the typical quarterback coach come out. Here's a script. Let's go run it. Do this. Like he, he kind of ran it like it was his practice, like it was his pro day, uh, like it was his offense. And they had a lot of young receivers out there from Michigan running routes for him. He was, you know, putting up hand signals and all this stuff. And, and he looked like he's a he put on, he's put on weight. He's added about 10, 15 pounds. And he threw the ball. Pretty well. I mean, he had some pretty impressive throws that you've probably seen, you know, on ESPN or online or wherever, social media. So he's got buzz about him right now. Like he's he's jumped up. He's gone from being, you know, end of the season, football season. He was probably a mid to late pick. Yeah, I, it would not shock me if he was the third player taken in this draft now. It would not. A lot of people were impressed with Mitch Trubisky's pro day, too. Yeah, well, he wasn't 27 and one as a starter when that's a championship, right? But he was picked second. <laughs> yeah. He was. Yeah. It's, it's a bustable position. Yeah. You know, I, I think Mac Jones does a lot of things right. Yeah. Right? Trey Lance has a lot of athleticism. Yeah. You know, Justin Fields has a lot of athleticism and, and and can throw the ball. It takes a month to release it, but, you know, and it takes a, a long time for him to figure out where to go with it. But, I mean, for all these guys, you do your due diligence, but – Live fire is what's going to be the one thing. Uh, what, what what would you – you're notorious for just nailing it at quarterback, Eric. Um, where would you go? Is that, is that a lie? Or look, I've had misses. You've had – we all have had misses. Uh, you're, you had Zach Wilson. Yeah. On your resume. I had Zach Wilson. You'll never live that one down. Yeah. That, that was a killer uh, for you. I was, I was higher on Mac Jones. I, that first year, by the way, the victory lap was sweet. I was uh, which, on Mahomes, though. I went on your show on A10. I said they should draft Mahomes. Uh, we were both on him early. I was, yeah. I was so, but here, here's I was on like, him when he was rated as a third round pick. So, yeah, uh, I yes. mean, we have here, successes. 
So I just, if you guys go to sumersports.com, I wrote an article last week about whether or not you should sit your court, sit rookie quarterbacks. And there's little to no evidence that sitting a rookie quarterback is actually good for them. We have Mahomes, we have Jordan Love, but we also have Trey Lance, we have Paxton Lynch, we have, you know, like there's, and so it's case by case. I do think J.J. McCarthy is the perfect quarterback for a team like Minnesota that has a good coach, a great supporting cast of tackles and wide receivers and tight ends, a a team like that to move up and take him and sit him beside, behind Sam Darnold. That, to me, is how the success happens for McCarthy. If McCarthy gets drafted by the Patriots at three, he has no, no shot, yeah. zero shot, because that team has no talent. And everybody I've talked to, and I know people, you know, like I, you know, I, my, a lot of the people that I work with used to work in the Michigan program. And I, everybody who, even the people who like JJ McCarthy say he has, he's a year away from playing, playing well. And so, and that's just because he just wasn't a volume player. When Michigan needed plays, their best player was Donovan Edwards or Blake Corum. He is not, you know, he just hasn't been leaned on as a quarterback. And so I don't mind going after the traits because I think I do think traits matter a lot. I think we learned that with Mac Jones and like you like, you know, picking uh, Kenny Pickett and all this stuff. You go after guys who have elite, elite athleticism and elite arm strength. And that's what McCarthy has. But I, I, he is a very dependent on where he goes quarterback. And for that reason, I have a hard time seeing him. Like I, I I need to see him pick third four, fourth out of the four guys because I just think the other three guys have a shot no matter where they go. I think McCarthy could be a very good Minnesota Viking. I think McCarthy could be a very good um uh, I'm trying to think of another team. Like I think McCarthy could be a very good Denver Bronco. Not that the Broncos have great talent right now, but they have a very good coach. I think that I think that McCarthy could go somewhere with a good offensive mind and have success. I think if he has to build, if they, if you have to build the whole airplane around him, I don't think he can be successful right away. He becomes Daniel I, Jones then, right? Yeah, I mean, and <laughs> Daniel Jones has overcome a lot, but like when Daniel you perturb that thing a little bit, it sucks. Um, what number of quarterback is he? Does anybody think he's going to go in the, go top three? Does anybody think that Bo Nix is going to go in front of him? Is he four? No, or is he going somebody else? No, no. I think there's only four that go in the first round, and I think. Given the history of the NFL draft, there's a really good chance that one of those four falls out of the top ten. And I think a lot of mocks have seen Drake May fall out of there. I will say for anybody who's trying to bet the draft, who's trying to predict it, Adam Peters was a San Francisco 49er. And the San Francisco 49ers did not leak anything when they were there. Anybody who thinks they know what the Washington Commanders are doing at two is lying. I would say he's a top three guy if those one of those three teams has a veteran starter in place. If the Minnesota Vikings go to three, and it gets tricky because Josh McCown coached Drake May, but yeah, Drake Drake May doesn't have anywhere close to the buzz around J.J. McCarthy um, that he would need to have right now. He feels as if people are starting to look at that last year he had in, in North Carolina and say, you know what was what was this? Was this really good enough for a guy? And so, yeah, there's going to be something crazy happen, but I feel like McCarthy as a top three pick is not a stretch now. I, I would have said it was a huge stretch a month ago. Yeah. All right. Uh, are the uh, Cowboys, their lack of moves, is that getting way too much run? Eric, are you okay with them sitting pat and not blowing things up? And what, what what's your reaction to the Cowboys and, and people not – uh, just because they're, they usually like to splash something around. They're not doing that this year. What's your reaction? I I, I think it's really good for them to be this way. Um, Dak Prescott's contract is really awkward. I think the more that you mess with it, the longer it gets. I know your opinion on Dak, and I respect that. I'm a little higher on him, but I don't think he's close. I don't think he's close to like the Mahomes tier. So, you know, that's where the money becomes. Uh, that's where the money matters. So. Um, no, I'm I, like, look, they still have Trayvon Diggs. They still have, uh, Micah Parsons. They still have CD lamb. They still have Dak Prescott. Like they'll be fine. And they have a pretty good coach. So I, I, I did, and they're, and, and they did lose Dan Quinn, but I think Dan Quinn was a little bit overrated as their defensive coordinator. So 
I think that they'll be fine. I and and all these teams that win free agency, they don't actually win anything. So that that's the undercurrent there as well. Would you trade one, two, or three for Dak Prescott? The first picks of the draft. Oh man, that's a and that contract. So it comes with it. Uh, well, so yes, uh, I would because the contract is just twenty nine million in base salary this year. The Dallas Cowboys would take the Cowboys can't really trade him um, because the Cowboys would take on sixty six dead. Um, it's a if you get him in a trade, it's an amazing deal. Yeah, I would trade. Yeah. I would I would trade one, two, or three for him. Yeah. Well, it depends on like the, for the Bears, yeah. For the Commanders, no. For who's in that? Who's in that three? Uh, the Patriots, the Patriots, no. no. Patriots, yeah. He wouldn't change the Patriots that much. I mean, if you're doing it, you're doing it to say he, he's the final piece of the puzzle. It's like a Matthew Stafford type thing. Mm-hmm. And so I don't think the Bears, you could say, would, given what they've done already and where they're at cap wise, could handle it and could still put a good team on the field in a weak NFC. But yeah, I don't know if I would trust the commanders or the Patriots to do that kind of move. No. But, but yeah, but look, it's Eric made the right point. The, the, the Cowboys have a tremendous roster. You shouldn't be penalized for that <laughs> at this time of year. I mean, they have to find a way to save enough money to sign a, a costly position at receiver, a costly position at edge rusher. Your quarterback obviously is costing a ton of money. They've won 12 games the last three years. And people forget this with the Chiefs. The Chiefs had a lot of success before Patrick Mahomes showed up. And they had to have the quarterback come to make it better. But ultimately, I don't think the Dallas Cowboys and the NFC are that far away from winning a championship. Well, that, that's where the Cowboys are. That's what I've always said. I, I do think Dak Prescott's a good very good quarterback. Yeah. Great gets thrown around all the time. I heard, listen, and I respect this guy. Mike Creamberg said, Justin Fields, you know, gives you the chance to have a great quarterback for 10 years. Where the hell is the line for great yeah. if, if he comes to that category? Yeah. He, he's a very good quarterback. He is Alex Smith, you know, with probably more weapons. Remember, Alex Smith had nothing no. at, at wide receiver. But, like, they in the playoffs do the exact same thing that the Chiefs did with Alex Smith. No. They get there. They have a nice regular season. He puts up nice numbers. They never win close games, and they never win playoff games. What's different? So you think That's it's a but, little better than out? And I'm out. I, I love Alex. Smith. I, I won't. I won't argue about little. Tell me he's way better. Let's then we'll fight. Is Otherwise, he closer to Pat, or he's closer to Alex Smith than he is Mahomes? He's sitting next to him on the couch. But I would say this: Look, I, I think Cowboys can win a Super Bowl with Dak Prescott. The Chiefs could never win yeah. a Super Bowl with Alex Smith. Not true. Yeah, that's the difference. Not true. You think the Cowboys can't win a championship with Dak Prescott? No, I think the Chiefs could have won with Alex Smith. It was just going to take like just like the Ravens can a miracle. Win with Lamar Jackson. Yeah, we saw what it was last year was yeah. the year to do it, and they almost did it. No one in Kansas City would I, ever want to get this, but it was really close for them at least getting there. And I think. Kyle Shanahan and the 49ers yeah. will help anybody once you get there. Um, so, you think Dax, you think I gotta Dax be honest Bird with you. I love Alex Smith to death. Going from two and fourteen to eleven and five, and then the the ten game win streak they had in twenty fifteen. I have so many great memories of Alex Smith. There was never a time that I thought the Chiefs were anywhere close to winning a Super Bowl when he was the quarterback. I it was a lucky football team. I mean, that's I, all Dak Prescott is. You just got to be badass everywhere else. What was Trent Dilfer? Well, they're up like 20 what years ago. Flacco? <laughs> okay, what was Joe Flacco? Yeah. Do you think Dak's better than Jalen Hurts and Brock Purdy? Um, no, I think he's right in that same same but, ball. I, do you think if, if Dak is playing for the Niners or the Eagles, you think they still lose those games against the Chiefs? Probably, yeah. But 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 those Dak's are good. the best quarterback in the world. Yeah. Those are the. I good, think I think they might win those games. Uh, those are the good examples, but but here's the point: he doesn't. He's not on those rosters because of how expensive he is. Yeah, but that's 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 the Cowboys' fault, though. Well, it is the Cowboys' <laughs> fault because they gave all the money to a running back when he was cheap. <laughs> yeah, that was their fault. Yes, it is the Cowboys' fault. I, again, I don't hate Dak. 
I just know what he is. Yeah. And I think I he's a think little bit. I think he's, I think he's 10% better than Alex Smith, which is a lot. I'm not going to argue about 10%. I'm not going to argue 10%. <laughs> like when Patrick showed up, it was different. <laughs> it is different. It's yes. just different. And this guy's not different. So we, enough about that. We argue about that all the time. Right, are, are the Cowboys so a chance? Just like he's like ready. It's yeah. are they what? Are, 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 are the Cowboys a championship caliber team right now? Yes, they are. Of yeah, of course they are. They are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Who was who, who was the last? Fable.com backslash Petro. Let's let's take a look at this here. The Cowboys have the Cowboys have the fifth best odds to win the Super Bowl, thirteen to one. Oh. Same as the Lions. They are the Lion. Is Jared Goff a championship caliber quarterback? Hell yes, he is. And top he five offense. Top five defense. Played in February. Yeah. Uh, he is. Jared Goff was not never made. playing in February. I love him to death. He was never doing it. Never. Jared but Goff he also didn't or, have the kind of talent that Dak Prescott has around him. Yeah. Are you kidding me? The Alex Smith talent. The one year they started to put the talent. Yeah, that was a good year. I, 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 I that. Yeah. yeah, in seventeen, he led the league in passer rating, yeah. and it, yeah. when he had his he had his chance to extend a little bit on the AFC, they they right. they crapped the bed against the Bills and the Giants because the defense he, was ranked thirty first. Yeah, and that's the thing sucks. you're going to have to be a complete team <laughs> yeah. with either one of them. Yeah, like you you can't like Patrick Mahomes. You can go Peyton Manning. With the Colts and win yeah, with the thirty. We all know defense. Mahomes is better. Like this is right, a, but that's why there's versus... no difference between Dak and Alex Smith, and 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 the the appreciable difference is negligent. Dak is better than Jalen Hurts, who had Patrick on the ropes. How do you quote yes. playoff wins with Justin Fields, but you give it no credence with Dak Prescott? Because Justin Fields can't win regular season NFL games. That's the difference. Dak Prescott has won 36 regular season NFL games the last three years. No, That's- he hasn't. That's not true. He was hurt. He was yeah. hurt yeah. for Sorry. numerous ones of Sorry. Yeah. Dak Prescott's won a lot of NFL regular season games the last three years. Yeah. Justin Fields hasn't won shit. That is the difference. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's- and that'll be the exclamation point uh, on today's <laughs> effort. <laughs> for Jeff Chidi for the NFL Network, Eric Eager uh, from Super Sports. I'm Sarah Petro. Remember, we're proudly brought to you by our friends at Gan Asphalt and Concrete with free consultations, no commissions, in house crews. Every single darn project comes with a written warranty. Gan Asphalt and Concrete, keeping your parking lot safe, making a great first and last impression with your customers, with your clients. That's what they do, celebrating 30 years as Kansas City's best. Find them online at ganasphalt.com. We say thank you very much for joining us here on the 2D NFL Podcast.